Good evening. We're glad to be back together once again in the pavilion here and the opportunity that we have to be able to study God's Word together and to be able to rightly divide His Word and His instruction for each and every one of us. Mom. Now I'm on. I needed to go one more slide. It is always an honor to be able to speak here at camp. It is for me. The older I get, the more of an honor that it is. In the years that I have been coming to Jesse YC, we have seen a lot of changes in our camp. Used to, we met up there under the little pavilion with chairs. Didn't have this at all. Baptistry was up there. Just a lot of changes for the good. Not only have we seen physical changes to our camp, we've seen changes in our world. In the time frame of 10 to 12, 13 years, we've seen a lot of changes in our world, in the way our world views things. The way our world recognizes God or even believes in God. And the sad part of that is, is you guys a lot of times are the ones who feel the blunt of it because you're young. So tonight, and you know the topic from your classes today is the thought of identity. Is that showing anything? There we go. The critic, the the critical identity crisis in our world today. A quick overview would be, we have a very confused world. We have a world, sadly, that our children do not know Jesus. A lot of our children do not know God. A lot, a lot cannot recognize a Bible. And I tell you those things because I teach and I, I'm on the front lines of young children. And when I have a Bible on my desk and a child walks up to my desk and says, what is that? I have the opportunity to say, this is what it is. And this is the story. Or if I say, Let's sing the song, Jesus Loves Me, or Who Knows Jesus Loves Me. And, and a small child says, I don't know. I don't know that song. Never heard it. That's the world we're living in. Not only do we have a critical identity crisis when it comes to how we recognize ourselves as gender, but we have a crisis in identifying ourselves with the people who still know God. Tonight, this topic, this topic that you discussed in, in class today, and we're going to carry it on tonight, is one that is culturally relevant. It may be that you've never heard or maybe the adults have never heard a biblical lesson or sermon concerning identity crisis in the gender war that we're in. 
But I want to say tonight on the forefront, it's more than us saying that, well, it's a sin and homosexuality is a sin and a man should know that he's a man and a woman should know that, he's, that she's a woman and, and, and that's the way it is. And it's a sin. And let me say from the forefront, any alteration from what God has created and the way God created it is a sin. But there is a biblical response to what we are seeing and what you children are living in your schools and in the culture in which you subside every day. And tonight I want us to go on, to, on a journey to be able to find that biblical response. And this is a thing that's not been, that just now came up in our world. In 2016, there was a store by the name of, the name of Target that opened its bathrooms to where they would be allowed a, a man who claim or a, a man who claimed to be a woman could go and enter into the woman's bathroom. And that was in 2016. They opened up their bathrooms for men to use and 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 ladies and, and I guess it could be said vice versa. And I want to say tonight that that concerns me and that can, should concern everyone in the sound of my voice tonight that we live in a society that we have came to the point that we say, if I feel something, that it becomes reality. Young people, let me tell you that just because you feel something doesn't mean that that's reality. I was talking to my class today and I told them, I said, I can feel like or I can say that I am a bodybuilder. I can puff up my chest and pump my arms and I'm a bodybuilder. But from the outside of you looking in, you can look and see that what? I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm building a body. But it's through chocolate gravy and biscuits. But just because you feel something doesn't mean it's reality. This is not something, again, that's just come about. In 2015, you know him as Bruce Jenner. I knew him as Bruce Jenner, as the Olympian athlete that is in the Hall of Fame of Olympians who says that I can't believe in a million years that I am where I am today as Caitlyn Jenner. I had always felt like I was a woman trapped in a man's body. And Glamour Magazine's Woman of the Year puts him on the cover. Thought I would never be where I'm at, he said, at 66 years old. So not only do we see that instance, and you say, well, this is something new. Well, no, that was, it didn't start in 2016 and it didn't start in 2015 because here's a newspaper clipping in, at the end of, of World War II in 1951 by a man named George Georgeson who became Christine Georgeson. And it was an ex, he was an ex GI of the world. And he had uh, special permission to go and have surgery done to start the process to become a woman. 
end up being a movie star. So this gender identity crisis is not something that has just came about. And one might say tonight, Brother Matthew, you're telling me that's really where we are in society? Sadly, I stand before you tonight and say yes. Not only did it go back to then, on the cover girl magazine, James Charles at 17 years old is the first male to appear on the cover girl magazine of the woman of the year. And in 125 year history, the National Geographic puts out a publication as a boy raised as a girl. Again, this is not something that's just happening. And understand tonight that this presentation is a condensed version of what I would have more time to present. And I'm trying to hit the high points of that. While I'm continuing on, could someone in the back, Micah, could you go get me a fork and a spoon? I just had a thought. But understanding the terms. You say, well, isn't it all wrapped up in just one big thing that, that, uh, Gender, it, it, all this gender stuff, isn't it just one big term? No, it's not. Gender refers to the psychological, social, and cultural aspect of being male or female. We could say that in layman's terms, the way I was born. Because I will reiterate that just in a moment. Because what our scripture reading say in Genesis 1? God created man in our image, and he created them what? Male and female. And folks, young people, hear me. Male is a male. And a female is a female. There is not a combination. God created only two genders. A boy and a girl. So the other term. Gender identity refers to how a person experiences him or herself or thinks of him or herself as a male or female. In layman's terms, how they experience themselves. Now you say, well, he might, he's making excuses for these, these kinds of behaviors. No, because remember what I said in the onset? Anything contrary to what God has created and the way God created it and how people choose to do that is a sin. All of these things that we're talking about is a sin. Another one, gender roles. Refers to the ways in which people adopt cultural expectations for maleness and females. And femaleness. These are some terms that you need to come to understanding. To really understand our gender identity crisis. In layman's terms, the expectation from our culture. Our expectation from our culture is that a male is a male and a female is a female and each one of them looks and acts in different ways. And rightly so because that's how God created us. You move on and you see the gender sexual identity and you see the little graph that I have. Basically, it covers the terms that we just talked about. It covers the way that you, you were born, the experiences that, that help you develop the who you are, and then what the cultural expectations are of the society. 
There are other terms in the, in the larger presentation of this as transgender, uh, third gender, gender bending, transsexual, cross-dressing, um, uh, gender fluid, gender ID. There's all sorts of terms that fall into this realm. But again, let me say, when God created you, he created you biologically. If you're a boy, you're a boy. God did not put two people inside of you. If he created you a female, he created you a female. God did not do that. God would not do that. A lot of the identity crisis young people that you are seeing, you and I are seeing, and here are some case studies concerning this thought. As you see here, we have nature versus nurture. Research has shown that an extreme closeness to the mother and the absence of the father have led to the development of gender identity disorder. This author goes ahead and writes, female to male transsexuals, those who go from a girl and wanting to be a male, a boy, report that their mothers were more overprotective and the fathers were more rejecting and less emotionally warm. You see a note down there at the bottom. Bruce Reamer was one of a twin. He had a brother, two boys born. He had a brother. And Bruce Reamer was born in about, about uh, at uh, 22 months old. He had a botched surgery that went wrong. And in that surgery, his mother and father decided to raise Bruce as a young girl. And as long as he, as he, as he came, became on up in age, they, they started doing some uh, hormone replacement and those things. And as they done those things, he began to figure out that something was wrong. He did not feel the way he was being raised. His mother and father chose to raise him to let his hair grow out, that he would spend the 90% of his time with his mother. And that at that point of spending time with his mother, he would be forced to play with girls and be given dolls. But and at their age of 14, he refused to have the last surgery. And Bruce, at 20 months old, was named Brenda. And we so we had Bruce to Brenda and then Brenda to David. He says, I'm going back to what I was born. Let me tell you something tonight, young people. God, when he created you, gave you two X chromosomes or he gave you an X and a Y. He didn't give you both. You are either one or the other. There's a lot of documented cases that we could talk about tonight. But it's a little bit like this. We all have the same five questions as we grow up. And these people. When I say these people, these people who are in this identity crisis, who are struggling with what they are and who they are, they have the same five questions. And I come back, back on, right? They have the same five questions that you and I have growing up. They want to know their origin. Where did I come from? Their identity. Who are we? The meaning. Why are we here? More morality. How should we live in their destiny? Where are we going? They have the same questions you and I have, but not the same answers because they don't have the same source. The source they're lacking is God's word. These people who are, are, are struggling with this gender identity need Jesus. They need the Bible. And if we ride away into the horizon and say, oh, we, they're, they're just messed up people, they're never going to learn the truth. 
And statistics say that out of 100 children, over 10% struggle with this at some point in their life. And it's a struggle of sin, just like lying and cursing and pornography and fornication and adultery. These people have these struggles. And by no means am I minimizing the seriousness of the sin tonight. But again, we have to understand this is reality. This is the world in which we are living. And we have to be prepared as Christians to do those things. God said in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created with whom? Male and female, he created them. Nowhere in Scripture tonight or any night do we see God creating any other gender than male or female. And we have to have a good understanding of that. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, if you look there in your Bibles, you see, and now you need to mark this, but then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was what? Very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. It was very good. You've seen these shirts that says God doesn't create junk. You see, God doesn't create things that don't work. In our reading tonight, he says, go into the world and multiply. There's two things that two people who are in a gender crisis that are together in a relationship, they cannot reproduce. I grew up on the farm, and I don't say this to be facetious, but you and you've heard it, you don't see two roosters walking arm in arm, do you? So really, if two chickens can figure it out that two roosters don't go together, surely on God's creation, we can figure it out because we're at the higher order of thinking. It's just not how God made it. But when you talk about relationships, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own husband. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't. When you hear the word wife, does that mean husband to you? No. It means a opposite sex, female. Paul writes, and he not only says that, but he says, let every woman have her own woman, right? No, he says, own husband. And again, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, the Lord said it was not good that man should be alone. He says, I will make him a heifer comparable to him. He made him a woman. He made him a helpmeet. Two people that were comparable but opposite in a lot of ways so they could, they could reproduce and, and re multiply the earth. That's what God said. But we must still remember throughout this lesson. But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. People who are in this crisis are sinners but God still loves them. God still loves them. And we have to still love them. And we have to continue to educate ourselves to understand these things. Just for a moment, what do I have? Fork and a spoon, right? Now, can this fork do what this spoon does? No. Can this spoon do what this fork does? But now the designer of a fork and the designer of a spoon, he says, well, people, some people like eating with a fork and a spoon. So remember, the designer, he says, I'm going to make something comparable of both. 
What was it? The spork. But again, the designer had to do that, didn't he? The designer, the one who invented the fork and the one who invented the spoon. I don't care how much this spoon wants to be a fork. It will never be a fork unless the designer changes it. This fork will never be a spoon. It will never be capable of doing what a spoon does and vice versa unless the designer changed it and makes the spork. Let me ask you this. Who is our designer? God. Has God chosen to change his original creation? No. Just as this fork will never be a spoon, a man will never be a woman. Just as this spoon would like to be a fork, will never be a fork, but a woman will never be a man. It's impossible. And you're seeing these things in the world in which you live. So what does all this mean? You see, tonight one might try to argue that God created man and, and, and who, whoever feels like a woman could, could be a woman. But I'm going to tell you tonight, I find no biblical support of that. Nowhere do I find that. Some say that, well, I'm, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. Oh, hogwash. The nature and the nurture of your experiences in life may make you feel that way, but God did not create you that way. And no one can ever change what God has created. They say, I'm confused. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33. Now it's used in the context of speaking in tongues and, and having order in the church. But God says he's not an author of what? Confusion. That knocks out the whole thing of people saying, I'm confused of who I am. God didn't create you to be confused about your identity. He gave you everything you need. Now, people who are experiencing these gender identity crises, if you go and dig and you talk and you find out with them, they have some trauma in their life. Somewhere. Somewhere it goes back to those things in their life. And let me say to you tonight that the Bible has no blurred line on this. The man and woman, again, was made in opposition, but also complementary to each other. Tonight, I got, and we're about to end. Our identity is rooted in the fact that God created us. We've read Genesis 1 and 27. God created man. God formed man. Chapter 2 and verse 7. Matthew chapter 8 and 24 through 27, God has the authority over all that he has created. In the book of Psalm and 100 and verse 3, as created beings, we are bound to our creator. We are his and he has the authority over us. You see, tonight we need to understand that God is our creator. God has a plan for you. He created you as a male. He created you as a female. He has a great plan for you as the way he created you. In Psalm 139, in verse 13, the Bible reads and says, For thou hast possessed my reins, or my inward parts. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. God created you who he wanted you to be. I want you to take a look at this. If we're going to make a difference, we must remember our identity. I want to switch gears for a moment. I wanted to present that theory stuff to you, but I want to switch gears for a moment. 
First Peter chapter two and verses nine and ten speaks that we are a people for God's own possession. God purchased you. God used his son to die for you. And in the response of him dying for you and for on that cross for the remission of your sins, God owns you. He created you. Hosea chapter 2 and verse 20, 23. I am your God and you are my people. We're a people for God's own possession. We've been redeemed. We've been bought. We've been purchased. As God's children through the blood of Christ. We've been sealed. As Christians, we have the name of Jesus written across us. You should have that tonight. As a Christian, many of you are baptized. You are a Christian. You understand that. Those who are baptized have put Christ on. They have Christ written across their chest. Those who have not been baptized are not Christ's children. We're all God's creation. They will become God's children one day at the age of accountability when they mature and fully understand. You'll make that decision to become a Christian. Some may need to do that tonight. I don't know. But I can tell you that if we're going to make a difference, we must remember our identity. We are God's creation. We are Christians. And our identity is demonstrated in the fruit of our lives. Ephesians chapter 4 and 6, the concept of walk as the one new man. Walk no longer as the Gentiles, Ephesians 4 and 17. Be imitators of God. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 through 11, proclaim, tell it verbally, abstain, hold back from those lustful desires. You belong to God. You are a special people. Used to, when I coached pretty heavily in football and things, and even with my own children, we would take trips. And one thing that Mr. Matthew would tell them, I would always tell them and say, remember who you are and where you come from. Because you are a representation of me. Many of you know my childhood. I didn't grow up very well. My dad was an alcoholic. We moved from town to town, lived in 18 different houses. I slept in ditches as a young man. But I always held on to God. Always. Because I knew I was His. And when you're in those situations like I was as a child, you really ain't got nothing else to hold on to. But you are God's people. You're God's creation. He created you to be special. His own special people. I want to end with something very personal to me. What is it? That's an old mirror. But it's not just an old mirror. If this mirror could talk and tell you what it's reflected and what it's seen, you would really be appalled. You know what appalled me? Horrified. This mirror belonged to my father. I love my father. He died in November. He and I didn't always have the best relationship because of the choices he made. But the last two years, we had a good relationship. I was able to restore him to the church and he died to my knowledge able to go to heaven. 
but this mirror belonged to him. They called me one night from Cookville Regional Hospital and said, we found your father in an alley, beaten, naked, and we've got him in the hospital. We don't know that he'll make it. He was there because of the use of drugs, alcohol, And he nearly left this world, but I prayed to God that give him one more chance. So I took him finally after 21 days in the hospital, and he finally, when I walked in the first time, he didn't know me. He didn't know his grandchildren, didn't know his mother, or his daughter-in-law. But I took him to the nursing home. So I had to clean out his apartment. So I went into his apartment and I cleaned out all types of drug paraphernalia and all kinds of stuff. And I found this mirror on the wall. I said, boy, if that mirror could talk, it would tell me a whole lot. So I took it down and I contemplated of throwing it in the dumpster. And I said, no, I want to hold on to it. I can use that somewhere in a lesson. Well, I did. I kept it. But the rest of the story of this mirror is his life had led him down a road by bad choices that he didn't have the money to buy a mirror. This actually came out of a big screen television that I bought my mother in about 1996. This is how they played it. it went to this and projected up to a screen. That's how they used to be. I had taken the TV to him to use and it tore up and he took it apart and he took the mirror out because he needed a mirror and he hung it on the wall. Actually, it has still one of the screws sticking out of the back. So it come out of an old TV. But you know, something about this mirror, no matter where this mirror is or, or what, it reveals, it reveals something. No matter where this mirror has been and what life it lived, it still can show you who you are. And when you look in this mirror, what do you see? You see yourself as a Christian? Do you see yourself as a sinner? Do you see yourself as someone who needs to be baptized? You see, this mirror has seen this mirror has seen needles and arms and people drinking and cussing and smoking. And it reflected all that. It reflects the bad, but it also reflects the good. But when you say, look at you, find yourself. Find yourself in that mirror. What does it tell you about yourself? Who you are, what you are, where you're going. You think about that. You see, mirrors don't lie. When you look in that mirror, you truly see yourself. And when you look in the mirror of God, and you compare yourself to the Word of God, you see truly who you are. When you look in that mirror, what do you see? Do you see a person that's going to heaven? Do you see a person who knows who they are and are God's children? A person who loves God? Or do you see a person who's playing like they love God? What do you see? You say, I could look in the mirror for you. It'd do us no good. Because when I look in it, I see myself. And I know what I am on the inside and the out. Only you. When you find yourself in there, ask yourself that question. The invitation of songs and eyes just break my heart. If this mirror should break, it would shatter your image. And you know what? When sin 
gets a hold of you, it shatters your image. It shatters of what God created and who he wanted you to be. And it shatters who you should be. What's your true identity tonight? Look at it. What's your true identity? Tonight, maybe you need to become a Christian. We hope you will. Maybe you've been considering becoming a Christian. We encourage you to do that. Young people, two most important decisions you'll ever make in your life is to become a Christian and to choose who you marry. Those two things will change your life for the good or for the worse, and they will affect your life more than anything else. So what's your identity? Are you a Christian? Do you need to be a Christian? Do you need to come home and repent? Whatever your need may be, we encourage you to, to take care of that. Don't go home with the devil tonight. Don't go back to the cabin and just say, ah, he almost had me. Defeat the devil tonight. Change your identity if you need to to a Christian tonight as we stand and as we sing together.